We had someone uh, ask a question that is related to the website at Knox College because you have put the book or are putting it on the website. Right. And I hope it's not like Wikipedia where anyone can go <coughs> no, in no, and no, change no, Lincoln's no. birth. No. But uh, <laughs> anyway, here they're asking, tell us why you put more footnotes on the Knox College Lincoln Center website than perhaps in the book. Uh, the, this book is 2,000 pages. Um, and my publisher said, look, you footnoted virtually every sentence in your manuscript. And that, that's my style. That's what I like to do. Because like many historians, I'm from Missouri. Not literally, but, but uh, figuratively speaking, because I'm always thinking, show me. Whenever I read a history book and somebody makes an assertion, I say, show me. What's your evidence? How do you know this? And I, I assume my readers want to know, too. And so I, I document my books very thoroughly. Um, but my publisher said, look, this book is pretty big to begin with, so you have to do a streamlined version of the notes. Um, and so you can only use the footnotes to identify directly quoted material, the source for directly quoted material. You can't talk about secondary sources, and you can't talk about the reliability of the people you cite, and the sort of thing that I usually do. Um, so I said to my publisher, uh, would it be all right if I posted a fuller version of the book online with all the scholarly apparatus with footnotes that, that do discuss the reliability of the witnesses cited and the, the, the where this fits into the secondary literature. <coughs> and my publisher very graciously said, yes, um, don't expect us to pay for it, but, but if you can get somebody else to do it. So Knox College Lincoln Study Center very generously agreed to do that. Um, and so uh, I, I, uh, I'm in the midst of preparing that for the online version. Um, and uh, I've, I've already submitted the first third of the book uh, for posting at the Knox College website. And one of the nice things about this version that's going to be online is that I can correct mistakes as they're found, as they're bound to be in a book of this length. And I can also add new information as it comes to light. Now, many authors wouldn't want to do that because you finish a book on one subject and then you move on to another subject. But I have a, I have a series of Lincoln editorial projects and Lincoln-related books that I want to write and edit. So my hand will be in the Lincoln field for a long time to come. And therefore, I, it will be a, no, no great problem for me then to, to add new information or to correct mistakes as they're discovered. Well, that, that brings me to one of the questions that came in by email to me. Uh, if you could give one morsel of advice to others who wish to write about Lincoln, what would it be and why? Because, of course, I thought your work had everything and there's nothing more to say on Lincoln. <laughs> well, but you're saying perhaps there's more. Well, there... there um, there's a project underway now at Springfield, uh, a new edition of the Papers of Abraham Lincoln. Mm. And unlike the edition that was published back in the 1950s and then supplemented uh, with a couple of volumes in the 70s and 90s, um, this, this new edition of the Papers of Abraham Lincoln will be based, uh, will contain not only the letters that Lincoln wrote, but everything that was written to him. And an awful, an awful lot of the letters that are written to Lincoln show up in the Lincoln Papers of the Library of Congress. And they're online, they're, they're word searchable, you can see the image as well as the transcription. But an awful lot of mail that came into the White House would be referred to the War Department or the Navy Department or the Interior Department or whatever. Um, and I have not spent a great deal of time in the archives, the National Archives, uh, I've done some work there. But there, there are cubic acres <laughs> of, of papers in the, in the National Archives. And the folks at Springfield who are doing this new edition of the Papers of Abraham Lincoln are going through the archives. And it's very tedious work. Um, and there's endless uh, uh, red tape and, and uh, crumbling documents. But they may find a great deal of new material, particularly about the patronage and how jobs were, were distributed and what particular forces were at work to get person X rather than person Y appointed to be a, at the, a, 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 an employee at the New York Custom House, for example. So I think we're going to find a lot more information about Lincoln and patronage in, in the work that they've done. Um, and there's a great deal of work that, that I did on, in newspapers, but there's a great deal of work, more work to do. Um, I just ran out of time. I had to get this book out by 2009, and so I, I did a pretty thorough job in, in newspapers, but not as thorough as I'd hoped to. Uh, and I intend to, to do, as I mentioned earlier, a volume that's, that's recollected words or reported words of Abraham Lincoln according to contemporary Civil War newspapers. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that, that there'll be a lot of new information there. Any advice to then someone who wants to write? Uh, get your fingers dirty. Go out and do original work and original sources. Uh, don't just trust the printed sources. Uh, there is... Uh, uh, 
if you're going to do something new, be willing to do the work in newspapers and manuscripts and archive, archival material. Um, and and what, what the, the, this book is pretty comprehensive, but there's almost one of the problems when you're writing a biography is, is that you have to keep a narrative moving along. And you can't stop very long to analyze particularly <coughs> difficult historical problems uh, because you, you'll break the narrative thread. Um, and so, so there's, there's, there's a lot of work to be done, analytical uh, examination. For example, one, one thing that I found particularly troubling and which, which cries out for more analysis than I could give it was Lincoln's uh, policy with regard to cotton trading. Um, that the Lincoln administration did allow cotton from the South to come through Union lines um, and uh, there were safeguards put in to make sure that the proceeds from that wouldn't help the Confederacy militarily. But in fact, those, those safeguards were not very rigorously enforced. And the cotton trading policy really did help the Confederacy because as the blockade became effective after the second year of the war, you, the Confederacy was having trouble getting cotton to Europe. But they, the, then this trade with the North took place. And some people have argued that the war went on longer, a year or more longer than it needed to have uh, because of the Confederacy's ability to, to profit from the cotton trade with the North. And uh, I, ju I just couldn't stop to investigate that in, in elaborate detail without, without breaking the narrative <coughs> thread. But, but there are things like that throughout the Lincoln administration which cry out for further in-depth analysis than I was able to give it in a, in a narrative historical biography. I want to say quickly and, and, and emphatically, the narrative thread is excellent in here. For Thank all you. the Thank detail you. that's there, this continues to move. And I, I get into the middle of uh, the second volume somewhere just because I had a question. I wanted to find out what you said about a, a particular moment. And I got to that. I read it. But then the narrative took over. Mm -hmm. And I started going. I said, wait a minute. I've <laughs> got to go back to something else. But it just takes over. It's wonderful reading. I, I think even if you can't read it all in one gulp, uh, <laughs> that it's, it's still terrific reading. Well, thank you. Uh, thank interestingly, you. just a quick footnote of what you just said about the cotton trade, a recent uh, just Oh, a year and a half ago, a little note came up, a letter from an orphanage in uh, Georgia, and a minister there came up to see Lincoln about getting cotton to bring back down there mm -hmm. to sell mm -hmm. for the orphans, and mm -hmm. that the proceeds would go there. Interesting thing, he first went to Jeff Davis, hmm. and Jefferson Davis, as quote, president, unquote, of the Confederacy, wrote down <coughs> an approval of that. Hmm. And then Lincoln, when he got this, strangely enough, also wrote an approval on the same page <laughs> that Jeff Davis did. And he hmm. never wanted to uh, show anything that there was any president anywhere. This was one country under rebellion. And these were all traitors down there and not uh, in a legitimate country. But he was giving hmm. some uh, hmm. shrift to that idea by signing the same president. It was only a week before the end of the war. So, but nonetheless, uh, I found that very interesting. It is interesting. Um, I have so many little things I want to comment on. One is the, the notes of the early biographers that you were able to bring up that really hadn't been mined. What was interesting or new, briefly, that you found just from the early biographers that had came, come up that were not used in their own biographies? <coughs> well, an, an awful lot of information in those interviews that the early biographers uh, conducted dealt with Lincoln's marriage. Um, and the gist of it was that Lincoln's marriage was far more woe-filled than previous scholars had acknowledged. For example, one of the very first interviews I discovered when I went to Brown, that, uh, the, the very first day I did original research uh, uh, at Brown, uh, one of those interviews was with Orville Browning, who was a close friend of Lincoln's dating back to the time that they were both in the legislature. And then Browning became a senator during the Civil War, and so uh, there was a, uh, they knew each other very well. And Browning said that when he was uh, visiting the president in the White House, which he did often, uh, that Lincoln would often talk to him about his domestic woes, and that he was constantly terrified that his wife would do something to embarrass him publicly. Um, and so I thought, wow, that's interesting. So I said, well, I'll, I'll go look at the Browning Diary. So I looked at the Browning Diary. It's published in two fat volumes. Mine are magisterial, his were fat. Um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, and, uh, and there were six passages in italics that said, uh, entry deleted because of reference to Mrs. Lincoln. And I thought, aha. So I hied out to Springfield and said, let me see the manuscript version of the Browning Diary. They said, nope, 
That's not possible. When we bought the diary, it was with a restriction that nobody could see the passages about Mrs. Lincoln, and they would never be pu they would never be published. Wow. And I thought, hmm. So I, I said, I bet you that some of the early biographers were able to see that that the, the enforcement of that ban wasn't very rigorous. So so I had reason to believe that that William E. Barton, an early biographer of well, an early 20th century biographer of Lincoln, had seen it. Uh, so I went to the Barton Papers at the University of Chicago, and this huge collection, and I went through that. And I found a lot of good material for my book, but I didn't find this particular diary entry or diary entries from the Browning Diary that I had hoped to find. But then a librarian, and God bless librarians, they have been enormous help, of enormous help to me in, in, in all the research I've done all around the country. Uh, a librarian said to me, well, you know, uh, so she said, did you find everything you wanted? And I said, well, there's one thing I didn't find. Um, and she said, well, you know, we got 12 more boxes of this stuff that haven't been, <laughs> haven't been processed yet. And that was like saying sui to a pig. And I, just, <laughs> I, I went right to it. Um, and then I found it. I found a diary entry. Um, and uh, it was uh, dated 1873. And Browning says, I had breakfast today with Judge David Davis of the United States Supreme Court. And David Davis was a very good friend of Lincoln's. He had been uh, uh, Lincoln's uh, campaign manager in 1860. He had been the judge that presided at many of the trials that Lincoln wa was party, uh, party to in, in Illinois. Um, uh, Lincoln appointed him as U.S. Uh, Supreme Court Justice, and he was the administrator of Lincoln's estate. And so Browning says to, to, uh, to David Davis, he says, well, you know, Ward Hill Lamon has just published this biography of Lincoln, and it's pretty, got a pretty unflattering portrait of Mrs. Lincoln in it. And uh, I think she had, she had, her, had her foibles, but that, that story about how she stole a lot of stuff from the White House when she left, uh, that seems to me to be grossly exaggerated. And David Davis says, no, no, no. The, pr the proofs of her guilt are overwhelming. They admit of no doubt. She was a natural born thief. She, <laughs> she, uh, she stole stuff out of her insatiable need to steal. Um, then he goes on to describe how she padded payrolls and expense accounts and then says she accepted a $20,000 bribe from the fellow who wanted to auction the cotton that had been captured at Savannah. And I thought, well, holy mackerel. Um, and uh, so <laughs> this is one example of how uh, the, this interview material, and an awful, there's an awful lot of interview material in, in the Tarbell papers, which is similar. And a lot of that was suppressed out of a chivalrous sense that you don't speak ill of a woman. But in our new <coughs> age, that those kinds of restrictions and double standards are no longer uh, applicable, I think. As a one word psychohistorian, um, how do you delve into a historical subject without having that person on the couch? How do you make your right, inferences and, de and decide that the person is this or that right. or possibly? Well, Give us some okay. insight. So if Mary Lincoln goes out, as, as David Davis tells uh, Browning, and she buys 300 pairs of gloves between January and April 1865, you can bet she suffers from mania. Because <laughs> normal people don't do that sort of thing. Um, and People, all of her friends said that she was either in the attic or in the basement. Uh, so she was, she was pretty clearly manic depressive. And one of the things that psycho, a psychohistorian is different from a psychoanalyst or a psychologist in that a psychohistorian merely does diagnosis. A psychologist is trying to cure or help the patient deal with, with the neurosis or psychosis that he or she is, is afflicted with. And we're, we're not trying to cure people in the past. We're trying to understand, trying to diagnose their, their uh, problem. And when, when you have such an example as, as Mary Lincoln, um, it's relatively easy and for a, a diagnosis of manic depression. And on top of that, I, have good I found good evidence that she suffered from PMS, um, that, that the, uh, there was a fellow named Dean um, who lived across the street from the Lincolns. Uh, and he told Ida Tarbell in 1895, he told Tarbell that when he was a little boy, his mother and her friends used to say that Mrs. Lincoln's irregular behavior and neurotic behavior wasn't a constant feature of life, that Mrs. Lincoln's erratic behavior tended to come in monthly cycles. And as a little boy, Dean said, Fred Dean, uh, to, to Ida Tarbell, as a little boy, I didn't understand what that meant. But as I got older, I did. And after Lincoln was assassinated, I went to Herndon, Lincoln's law partner, and said, this is what my mother and her friends understood to be Mrs. Lincoln's problem. And then Herndon said, yes, that's what I always understood, and that's what Lincoln always understood. So when you get testimony like that, it can help you uh, delve into the, to, to, to identify uh, patterns of, of neurosis. One quick question, please, yeah. brief. So, uh, the question comes up as, as to uh, 
why Lincoln named his sons the way he did and, and what that indicates and how Mary Lincoln made that helped make that decision. The striking thing about Lincoln's naming of his sons is not that the firstborn son was named Robert Todd Lincoln after Mary's father. That was the tradition in those days. You named your m male children after their grandfathers. So the first son is named after Mary's father. Then the second son comes along, and, and, and as you mentioned, uh, the second son is not named after Lincoln's father, which you would assume would be the normal progression, but is named after Lincoln's political ally and law partner or law, law associate, uh, Edward Baker. So then the third son comes along, and Lincoln doesn't name that son after his father. Uh, he names the third son after his wife's half-sister's husband. Um, and th there's, there's psychological significance, I think, in this, because Lincoln was deeply estranged from his father. And one of the, in and, and for example, Lincoln writes a letter um, to his stepbrother, living in Char outside Charleston, Illinois, about 100 miles from Springfield. Uh, in which uh, the, uh, the stepbrother had written to him and said, our father's dying, I would like to see you now. And Lincoln writes back to the step, uh, and the Lincoln's father didn't write because he was illiterate. So Lincoln writes back to his stepbrother saying, tell our father that it would be more painful and, than pleasant if we were to see each other now. Pretty harsh. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the fact that he didn't name any of his sons after his father, at least while his father was living, is, a, is an index, uh, an indication of the estrangement that he felt for his father. And then when the fourth son is born, he is named Thomas, but his father, that is his father's name, but his father didn't know that his name would be carried on by a grandson because he died before Tad, as he was known, was born. And Lincoln didn't call him Tom or Thomas, he called him Tad. And I think that too is psychologically significant as a further index of how uh, estranged Lincoln was from his father. And that estrangement from his father is an important <coughs> element in understanding why Lincoln hated slavery. And this is a somewhat complicated argument that I don't have time to go into in full detail here, but I basically argue that Lincoln hated slavery early on because his father treated him like a slave. His father would rent him out to neighbors, Lincoln would go perform hard, back-breaking work in the hot sun, and he would turn over all of his profits to his father. That was the law of the land. And when Lincoln comes to denounce slavery, he, he eschews almost all the standard arguments against slavery except one, namely that it's an outrage that somebody goes out in the hot sun all day and does backbreaking work and somebody else derives all the profits. It's interesting that recently I had a portion, a small scrap from Lincoln's copy book, not the sum book, but the copy book, mm -hmm. the second one that he mm -hmm. had that is really basically unknown. And on this he's doing his, his penmanship and he uses Thomas Lincoln over and over oh, really? and over and over mm -hmm. in this particular scrap. He's using his father's name even though he's famously at odds with him. That's uh, interesting. So That's a new piece of information. I'd love for you to write on that at some yeah, point. I will. I'm going to just quickly close with one question again very briefly sure. uh, since it's on names. Uh, you speak about how Lincoln got his sobriquet, Old Abe. What does that tell you about how he, what, what Lincoln's image was among his friends? Well, it, one of the striking uh, features of, of Lincoln's life is that people began to refer to him as old when he was in his 30s. <laughs> and he didn't look old, that is to say he didn't have gray hair, he wasn't prematurely bald and the like, but Lincoln radiated a quality of being old. And his, even his playmates said about that, he seemed to be a, a man when others were boys. Um, and I argue in, in my first book, and, and to a lesser extent in, in the new book, that this was a, an example of, of an archetype, that the great uh, Swiss psychologist Carl Jung used, argued that, that we're all dominated in part, at least, by, by an archetype that, that has nothing to do with the way we were raised or what our parents were like. Um, and it's a complicated argument I can't go into here, but, but Lincoln seems to have been dominated by the old man archetype and, and, and its positive phase. That is, he radiated a quality of being old in the positive sense of being old, like, like you and me. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 that is to say, wise, nurturant, uh, generous, supportive, uh, and, uh, and people, people responded to that. Uh, and, and they sensed that in Lincoln, even though his physical appearance didn't suggest oldness. Um, and I think that helps. And that's one of the reasons that why he was such a successful president. That, that when, when people saying we are coming Father Abraham, 300,000 more, that father image of a wise, benevolent, uh, nurturant, supportive, uh, wise father was something that was part of Lincoln's whole personality. It wasn't something that just came from his writings or, or his speeches. It was, it was his personality and his whole quality of, of being uh, 
And that inspired trust. And without that trust, uh, no president can really be successful. And Lincoln was remarkably successful in part because of his ability to inspire that trust. Michael, thank you so much well, for being Dan, here well, with thank us. thank you so much. And uh, appreciate John Hopkins Press from, for getting you here and uh, look for your next uh, book and you'll come back hopefully as well. We have many more books for you to sign. Behind me here are just some of them. The Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall. <laughs> and so we'll keep it going. We'll get all of your books signed. And we thank all of you for coming out and being with us this evening as well. And of course, for all of you for being uh, at virtual book signing uh, once again. We'll be here again. Please come back. Thank you to the staff of the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop for all their help in this. Do come back. Thank you. Thank you, Dave.